Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Let me read just a couple of verses. We're going to look at the entirety, God willing, of the chapter this morning. But let me read the first couple of verses and maybe one in the middle and at the end. Solomon writes, Who is like the wise? And who knows an interpretation of a thing? A man's wisdom makes his face shine, and the hardness of his face is changed. Let's go down to verses uh, 6 and 7. For there is a time and a way for everything, although man's trouble lies heavy on him. For he does not know what is to be, for who can tell him how it will be? And then the last couple of verses, verse 16. When I applied my heart to know wisdom and to see the business that is done on earth, how neither day nor night do one's eyes see sleep, then I saw all the work of God that man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun. However much man may toil in seeking, he will not find it out. Even though a wise man claims to know He cannot find it out. And so this chapter opens really commending wisdom. It closes talking about the limitations of wisdom. In between we see the sovereignty of God over all things, all people, and all events. And for the Christian that is a source of great comfort. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your word and your people. Lord, thank you that you have spoken and you have not stuttered. That your word is clear, it is powerful, it is authoritative, it is true, trustworthy. Everything that we need to know about you, how to know you, how to live for you, is contained in the scripture. Thank you, Lord, that we do not have to rely this morning on the the endless philosophies of man. We don't have to rely on our experiences and our feelings, our dreams and our imagination. But we have the sure and certain word of God. But, Lord, we come as needy men and women and boys and girls. We need wisdom, the wisdom from the Word. We need the cleansing of the Word. We need you to enable us by your Spirit through the Word. We need you to change us by the Word, to inform us, to direct us, to lead us by the Word. And we need your spirit to open our eyes that we might behold wonderful things from your word. And that is our prayer this morning, O Lord, that you would do just that. That you would open our eyes and our ears and our hearts that we might see and hear and understand. And that you might change our wills that we might obey. Lord, I pray that your spirit would be on me. That you would attend the preaching of the word that your word would be on my lips and that your spirit would empower me to preach your word. Lord, we commit ourselves to this, the preaching, the study of the word. Help us, Lord, to give our deepest attention and our wholehearted devotion and to submit ourselves unquestionably to the Word of God. We pray this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we all know that there are many burdens and challenges that we face, but what is is one of the things that is most troubling to you? What's one of the things that weighs most heavy on your heart? That you need God's wisdom You need God's help. 
You need God's direction for. Well, look down to verses 6 and 7 again. And Solomon says here in chapter 8, verse 6, that there's a time and a way for everything, although man's trouble lies heavy on him. Man's trouble lies heavy on him. Now what is the trouble that he speaks of here? For he does not know what is to be. For who can tell him how it will be? In other words, the great burden on man's heart is, he doesn't know what is coming, and it's with great specificity, nor does he know how it's going to happen. He doesn't know what is to be, and he doesn't know how it's going to be. So man is gripped with many fears about the future. What's going to happen? What is going to happen when, fill in the blank, when A happens, B happens, or C happens? What is going to happen when? Not knowing the future is a heavy burden, oh man. And not knowing how things are going to transpire in the future. I mean, just look around us, uh, both world events as well as personal challenges that we face. I mean, just in the last few weeks, we, we've seen increased trouble in Iraq, civil war. It's broken out in Iraq, and we think of all the, the time and the energy and the money, the investment that has been made in that country, and it seems, at least from the outside looking in, without a lot of inside information that we never really have, it's amazing how we sort of stand back and read the news and make our comments and analyze the political situation and how little we really know about what's going on, but things seem to be deteriorating there in, in Iraq. While I was away, we heard while in class one day of a plane being shot down near the Russian border and hundreds of people killed as a result. And now we're hearing horrific stories in the aftermath of that with bodies strewn all over the place, bodies disappearing, uh, evidence disappearing, lots of question marks connected to that plane being shot down. We know that Russia is on the move in our land and seeking to exert its power and authority in various places around the world to subject others to their control. We've read uh, in recent days of the intensifying conflict in Israel and as they deal with Gaza situation. We uh, continue to read about the continual threats to religious liberty in our country. Uh, we know and we rejoice over the recent Supreme Court ruling over the Hobby Lobby case, but for many of our senators that doesn't mean a lot. We can still try to find ways to thwart what the Supreme Court has decided. And so religious liberty continues to be under the gun here in our culture. What else happened while I was away? <laughs> I mean, a lot of tragedies and world events and questions. And we wonder, what does the future hold? Now, there have been traumatic events throughout history. Deep problems of plague and peril and war. But many of us are seeing some of the most difficult times we've ever seen in our lifetime here in our country, haven't we? Now, it's important to have a historical perspective of things, lest we grow weary and well-doing. That's one of the reasons we should study history. We should understand we're not the only civilization in the history of man that's facing uh, difficulties and challenges. We need to understand history. It gives us perspective. But it, all the issues and questions and challenges of this world leads us to wonder and to fear what's going to happen next. But it's not only the sort of world events that we Face. It's the injustices right at home. I got home late last night and, and picked up the newspaper, the local newspaper, and I actually read it this morning. When we first moved here, and did we move in 1991? Is that right? <laughs> I think we came to the area in 1991, and when we first moved here, soon after, or right before, we heard of the murder of a young man. Uh, he's a local resident. He's working and coming, and he had witnessed a, a crime, I believe it was an armed robbery, 
and he was to testify in court. In a couple of days before the court, the father of the, of the, the young man that committed the armed robbery and some other folks connected with him ran this witness off the road, shot him, beat him to death, buried him in a grave, and burned his vehicle. Saturday, that was on a Saturday night, they went to church in Dawsonville on Sunday morning. That was in 1991. And last week or two, uh, they, uh, this man who was guilty of the murder of this young man in coming, who was working in coming, faced pardon and parole board. Everybody expected that uh, they would not commute his sentence. He was to die July the 15th by lethal injection. But they did something very rare, according to the paper. They commuted his sentence. It's without question that the man committed the crime. It was confessed. The evidence is overwhelming. He was convicted in court. <laughs> He's been on trial. He was to be executed. His sentence, his death sentence was commuted. A quote from one of the <coughs> family members said, We feel that the justice system failed and that there is no justice at all. Our local sheriff was quoted as saying he's in disbelief. The prosecutors pointed out, well, you know, we're, we're, we're glad at least this man will spend the rest of his life in jail, but justice is incomplete. Incomplete justice. And so we, we read about things like this. We've read already in Ecclesiastes, and we read again uh, here that the wicked engage in wickedness and verse 11 says because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed speedily the heart of the children of man is fully set to do evil you as a, a regular guy or gal who has the Bible at hand you know more than the elites of our culture who are not very much interested in executing the sentence for the guilty quickly and the Bible tells us this is a deterrent to evil this is a deterrent to crime because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed speedily the heart of the children of man is fully set to do evil when you live in a country in a culture where where crime is winked at it's not dealt with and it takes years and years and years often for things to even come to court and then there's, you know, you hire the right high-priced lawyer regardless of what you have done. And you might get away with murder and other heinous crimes. The Bible says when justice is not executed speedily, people will be set on doing evil. Their hearts will be fully set to evil. We see that, don't we? And so I picked up our little papers often you know, it's like one glance and you're done. There's not much there. And that was the front headline story, the, the uh, commuting of the sentence. Read of church burglaries. We've had in churches all across the county. There have been numerous burglaries in the last few months. And finally they caught the guy uh, this week. Read of uh, a rape and a kidnapping. A lady was invited to a birthday party uh, here in the community. She got there. There was a guy but no party. And he kidnapped her and raped her repeatedly right here at our little safe community. Picked up the paper, read of all sorts of financial woes in our county, in our community. And we read of the death of the young and the old. The world situation, the local situation. What about your personal situation? Many of you right now, I know, are facing some challenges and you and they're, maybe they're not pressing down on you so hard at the moment but they're heavy on your mind because you're wondering how it's going to turn out what is going to happen next month or next week or, or next year with this particular situation that seems so volatile in your life and in your family and you're heavy burdened because of that the fear of the unknown can grip our hearts. How are things going to turn out? 
The world in which we live is a very dangerous world. It's a very difficult world. It's a very hard world to live in. Though we have freedoms and peace that others do not enjoy in other areas of the world, it is still very difficult. Now Solomon gathers the congregation here in Ecclesiastes and he gives instruction, he gives wisdom on how to survive with wisdom in an unjust and unpredictable world where the wicked often prosper and the righteous often suffer, a world in which all of us are facing certain death. How can we live? How can we not be gripped by such fear that we are paralyzed to the point we cannot function joyfully in a world filled with so many world problems, local problems, personal problems, family problems. How can we function? Shouldn't we just check out? And many people choose that route. Well, he gives us some wisdom here. Wisdom is needed for survival. And of course, as Christians, we're not interested in simply marking time and surviving. We want to thrive in the world that God has placed us in under the sun. We've been learning how to do that. We don't want to just sort of grit our teeth like the stoic and show no emotion and just sort of put our head down and barrel through the, the line and run the ball down the field like that. We want to honor Christ by rejoicing in the Lord always. And that's what he's been helping us to do in Ecclesiastes. So we need wisdom for survival. And we need wisdom for dealing, first of all here, with authority. You know, our, our culture, many in our culture, don't think they don't want any authority. And they chaff against authority. They rebel against authority. The bumper sticker says, question authority. There's an undermining of authority in our culture. We imagine we want to be free spirits, that everyone is free to do whatever they want, whenever they want it, without any sort of restraint. <clears throat> and of course, we know that that leads to total slavery but that's the mindset of many in our culture don't don't give me any restrictions any boundaries let me spread my wings and let me fly and so Solomon says well this is how you deal with authority God has established authority we know that from the Old Testament we know it from the New Testament even the wicked authorities that exist in the world have been established by God God not the author of wickedness but God raises up leaders and he puts down leaders and there is no authority except it is from God. It operates under the sovereign authority of a holy and righteous God. We know that from Scripture. So our responsibility as believers is not to throw off authority. We are to respond well to the authorities that God has graciously put into our lives. Well, he talks about the authority here of an, an eastern king ruling over his people with you know, almost unlimited authority, at least on earth. Of course, there's, regardless of the power and the might of any king, he's always limited by the hand of God. He's always limited. But under the sun, he has almost unlimited power, unlimited authority. He can control what happens in this life under the sun. And so he opens this. He says, Who is like the wise? And who knows the interpretation of a thing? A man's wisdom makes his face shine and the hardness of his face is changed. I say, keep the king's command because of God's oath to him. Be not hasty to go from his presence. Do not take your stand in an evil cause, for he does whatever he pleases. For the word of the king is supreme. And who may say to him, what are you doing? Whoever keeps a command will know no evil thing, and the wise heart will know the proper time and the just way, for there's a time and a way for everything. How do we respond to authority? Now here, we're not under a king, but all of us are under authority. There's no person in this room that is not under authority. God has established authority, the authority of the state, the authority in the family. Authority in church, authority in other arena, in the job place. God has established authority. How do we respond to authority? That's the application. Now, he's speaking specifically of a kingdom and a king and subjects. 
We don't have anything exactly like that. But nevertheless, there are principles on how to respond to authority. We need wisdom. We need wisdom. So here we have a servant in the king's court. A king that is, has absolute authority that's often unpredictable. You just don't know what he might do. He does whatever he wants to do. That's what kings do. <laughs> you know, they eat what they want. They, they do what they want. They go as they please. And so we have this king with almost unrestricted authority. And we have a servant in his court. And foolishly dealing with the king can lead to unnecessary trouble. Be wise. He warned, the scripture warns us in the Old Testament. The scripture warns us in the New Testament. Be wise. Jesus sends his disciples out as sheep among wolves. Be wise. Be wise. Choose wisely what hills you're going to die on. It's not necessarily a sign of compromise when you, you don't die on a particular hill. There's some people who see everything in black and white. And any time you don't take a stand at a particular time on a particular issue, you're considered a compromiser, right? But the scripture and history teach us there's a time to stand and there's a time to pull back. There's a time to speak and there's a time to be silent. The wise man is able to discern the times and the seasons. We rightly admire the, the martyrs who stood faithfully for Christ because they were in a situation where they were called upon to deny their faith. But there's not, no, it's not necessarily virtuous just to be a martyr for the sake of being a martyr. The scripture calls us to wisdom, to wisdom. So don't bring unnecessary trouble. No, never compromise core convictions, but be wise in the way you deal with that. Now, how do we deal with those in authority, or anyone else for that matter? He opens up by speaking of a pleasant demeanor. A pleasant demeanor. And we, one only has to think of Daniel. Uh, Daniel was commanded, in essence, as the king was manipulated by some of his advisors, to allow no one to pray except to the king. But Daniel was a man of conviction. Daniel couldn't obey the command not to pray. And Daniel went on about his life, continuing to pray several times each day, as was his custom. You know, the king might say, don't pray. The godly man has to pray. But there's no evidence at all that Daniel had a rebellious spirit about him. No evidence at all that, King, I'll, I'll show you. I'm going to obey God. No, no attitude connected to Daniel. No negative spirit. No, listen, I'll show you. None of that. Daniel, it seems, quietly went on about his business doing what God had specifically directed him to do, and we know in his word, a matter of core convictional truth. So how do you deal with those in authority? Even when you have to disobey authority, though that should be relatively rare and it should be essential stuff, you do so with a glad heart and a pleasant demeanor. I tell you, you see a lot of professing Christians who are just bitter and angry and say the most awful things about those in authority in our land. I mean, don't, again, as we say, don't be surprised when unbelievers sin. Pray for those in authority. Pray that God would restrain them from evil. Pray that God would convert their soul and change their lives. But there's a demeanor that should characterize a Christian from a hard demeanor to a sweet demeanor. And that's what he says here in chapter 8. Wisdom, a man's wisdom, makes his face shine even in the midst of trouble. Even in the midst of difficulty. So pleasant demeanor. Secondly, how do we respond to those in authority? In whatever realm it may be, here specifically the king and the kingdom, we do so through obedience. Why do we obey the king? Why do we obey the authorities of the land? Why do, are we submissive as citizens in the United States of America? Why do we do that? Well, here he speaks of God's oath to him. And I think the, the, uh, in the Hebrew it would, it would be more the oath of God to the person obeying. 
In other words, the person obeying the king has pledged an oath of allegiance to the king. He's pledged his loyalty to the king. Long live the king. He's committed himself to being a submissive citizen in the king's court and serving in the king's court. Godly people can serve in ungodly presidencies. Godly people can serve in ungodly kingdoms. Godly people can serve in ungodly situations uh, under ungodly leaders at work. And there's a way to do that. And that's what he's teaching us here about the kingdom. And so he says, in essence, be obedient. Be obedient because you're under the authority of God. You have an obedience to God first that causes you to be obedient to those who are in authority over you. That really helps, doesn't it, with submissiveness in life. In whatever realm we're walking in, we understand that our submissiveness, first of all, is not to the authorities that God has established in our life, but our submissiveness, first of all, is to God. And so I honor God when I am a submissive citizen of the United States of America. I dishonor God when I am a rebel rouser, when I am a disobedient troublemaker with a bitter spirit and an ungodly demeanor in our land. Be obedience. Be obedient. It's the right thing to do. Turn, let's turn to Romans 13 for just a second. Let's turn to that and take a look at it again. I don't have time to go into that. We've done that before. Let's just look at it so we can see it. Let the scripture speak to us. Let every person, not some people, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. For if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all who, whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed. Honor to whom honor is owed. And on and on he goes. So this is how we live under authority we do so with a, a cheerful demeanor not grudgingly or of necessity God loves what kind of giver a cheerful giver we don't do so submissively and we pay taxes a lot of times Christians some Christians will say we shouldn't pay taxes in our culture to a government who's going to take those taxes and use those that money for evil purposes they're wrong you should pay taxes it's a matter of being obedient to God and we could just dig into this pretty, pretty deeply. But the Roman government was relatively evil, wouldn't you say? Committed to all sorts of things. And so when the Pharisees tried to trap Jesus and say, you know what? Caesar or God? Jesus says, Jesus taught, pay your taxes. Paul says, pay your taxes. The scripture says, pay your taxes. When you pay your taxes, you are not party to the evil deeds that is done by our government. You're being obedient to God. It is the right thing to do. It is the right thing to do. We'll see some more of that. Of course, we know the caveats. If we're being commanded directly by those in authority to disobey, disobey the clear, revealed will of God, then we obey God and not man. But even then, we do that with the right attitude. We also need to be careful that it is, the, it is what Scripture is clearly stating on core convictions, that what, this is what the Scripture teaches, rather than this is you know, something we prefer. We want to make sure that we're standing on the right ground here. So, pleasant demeanor, obedient. Then he says, don't be hasty. Don't be hasty. Now, this can be interpreted a couple of ways. He says in verse 3, Be not hasty to go from His presence. That could mean, in the Hebrew language as such, it could mean, don't leave the king's presence in a huff and a puff hastily because you disagree with the decision he's 
rendered, that could be perceived as disloyalty. That could be perceived as disloyalty. It could also mean, it, al- it could also mean don't, don't leave quickly, but also it might mean don't, don't stay too long. It's just sort of one of the nuances of the language there, and it could be interpreted either way, and you're not going to end up off the rails either way. But when the, the verdict has been rendered, leave quietly. That's sort of the, uh, one of the potential ways to interpret this. So either don't leave in a huff and a puff and run out of his presence and show disloyalty. And when it's time to leave, don't hesitate to leave, but leave so with a right spirit and a right attitude. Now don't you see how just taking what the Scripture's teaching here about authority in a kingdom applies in every arena of life? Your workplace, you've got a boss, right? You may be the boss. You might own the company, but you're still under somebody's authority. Maybe it's a board. <laughs> Maybe it's somebody else, but you're under authority. The government, the family, all the different jurisdictions that God has placed authority. Can't you see how this might be winsome? How this might be used of the Lord for His glory and your good and bring help to you and your family and your nation and your company? Just your attitude, a sweet disposition, a godly obedience, not huffing and puffing out of the presence, leaving quietly when the verdict has been rendered. And then he says, in essence, don't die on every hill. I mentioned that earlier, but see it here in verse 3. Do not take your stand in an evil cause, for he does whatever he pleases. Even when those in authority do what's wrong, you're not to do what's wrong, but it's not always proper And the wise man will have discernment from being saturated in Scripture, knowing the heart and the mind of God, to act wisely and understand, be able to interpret a matter, be able to bring godly perspective to a matter. It's not always the right thing to say, okay, this is where I stand, and stand or fall, I die. That may not be God's will. That may not be the wisdom of God. It may bring great unnecessary hardship to you and your family and others. Now, the Christian has to deny himself, take up his cross, and follow Christ. He must be willing to stand before the emperor, before the pope, before the leaders of the land, before anyone at all, the great authorities religiously or in civil government, and say, here I stand, I can do no other. There's a time for that. But you need to be wise and choose thoughtfully when to die on the hill. When to die on the hill. On the hill. That's what Solomon is telling us here. So obey, have a cheerful spirit, don't engage in evil. I mean, on the one hand, don't die on every hill. It may not be God's wisdom or will for you to do that. On the other hand, don't be a promoter of evil. Don't do evil. Don't respond to evil with evil. How would that change your parenting? Your children are doing evil. How do you repay them? With evil? Is that the way to do it? (laughs) Scripture says don't repay evil for evil. So how do you repay when your children are being disobedient, when they're being angry without a cause or being angry with a cause, but sinfully angry with their brother or their sister, and you as a parent, how do you respond to that? Are you going to respond with unrighteous anger towards them? There's unrighteous anger, there's a righteous anger. There's an unrighteous discipline, there's a righteous discipline. There's a reactionary discipline. There's a thoughtful, biblical, prayerful, thoughtful wisdom in that. And so whether you're standing before the king or whether you're dealing in relationships in your family or at work or anyone else, don't repay evil for evil. Don't say, I'll get them. I'll show them. I'll straighten them up. I'll fix that. I'll take matters into my own hand. I'll deal with the issue. No. Don't engage in evil. And then he says we've got to discern the times and the seasons. Look down to verse 5. He says, well, verse 4, he says, uh, the word of the king is supreme, and who may say to him, what are you doing? I mean, don't, you don't argue, you don't d- debate at you know, the first stand that you disapprove of that the king makes. That's not your gut, knee-jerk reaction to get into a debate with the king, to, 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 to argue with the person in authority. 
And it seems here that perhaps the, the servant has brought an appeal to the king. We live in a land of many appeals. We can appeal to those in authority, right? We can appeal to our local magistrates. We can appeal to our local congressmen. We can appeal in various ways. We can appeal at the workplace. We can appeal at home. A wife has, should be able to appeal to her husband without fear. Without fear of being crushed as a result of the appeal. The same in church. A church member should be able to appeal to their leaders in the church without fear of being crushed because of the appeal. So we have the freedom of appeal in all the arenas in which we exist, all the various jurisdictions of life. But at the end of the day, don't be argumentative. Trust that God has established the leaders. Make, in our country, we have lots of freedoms as well, right? We have elections. <laughs> and elections matter, right? Elections matter. Who, who we elect as a people, it matters. It has, a, it has an impact on our land. We elected President Obama for two terms. That has had an impact on our country. We, we are part of the American people. We as a country, we elected the president for two terms. There have been great consequences as a result of the election of the president. We can appeal. We can try to change laws. We can elect, we can try to elect people. We can vote. We can do all sorts, and we, before we do any of that, we need to be on our face praying. How often have you prayed for the president in the last, uh, how many years has it been? Six years. How often have you prayed for the president that I know most of you, all of you, probably disagree with? And vehemently so, and rightly so, on most, many points. How many times have you got on your face before God and prayed for the president? Will you do that right now? Even as I'm preaching, will you pray for the president? For those in authority over you? Would you ask God's help in their life and family and in their decisions and that he might restrain evil? And he might save those in authority over us who are lost? Don't be known as being an argumentative person. Be known as a praying man. Have the word of Christ in your heart. As a Christian, how do you do that? I mean, really, things are hard. We've talked about the world, the, the local, the family issues. We need to have Scripture saturated in our hearts. I, I heard about a professor at my school this week who, I, it's, I think the story was for 40 years, been reading the Scripture through four times a year. It takes about two hours a day. He has to rise very early to do that and then all of his other responsibilities. But can you imagine the impact of reading the Scripture over and over and over, day after day, week after week, year after year, would have on your thinking and your ability to deal with difficult people and your ability to honor Christ in all things. I mean, do you know God's word? Do you think the thoughts of Christ after him? Do you know the mind of Jesus? Then it's going to require getting in the word. And a lot of times folks say, well, you just don't know my schedule, but you'd be surprised at some of the busiest Godly people in history, the amount of time they spent in Scripture, it requires discipline. It requires understanding what's really important in life and committing yourself to that thing. And what's more important than knowing God and knowing His heart and knowing His mind and having His Word on your lips. You know, you can read the Psalms through uh, each month several times. You know, if you read 20 Psalms a day, I don't know how long that would take you, but if you read 20 psalms a day, what would that be? Each month you'd read the psalms through. You did that month after month after month, getting the mind and the heart of the Lord. Jesus walked with wisdom. Let's look at a couple of passages. Let's look at Proverbs first of all, and let's go to the New Testament, look at a couple of passages, and I'll try to move a little faster. Proverbs 14. I know I don't have to make up for not being here the last two Sundays in one sermon, so don't, you know, don't be alarmed. He's going to make up for it all. Plus, he's been at school all week. Hearing these teachers, he's going to go crazy this morning. 
Proverbs 14, 8, the wisdom of the prudent is to discern his way. But the folly of fools is deceiving. And then, verse 15, the simple believes everything, but the prudent gives thought to his steps. Let's turn to the Gospels. Let's turn to Matthew 22. Matthew 22. See, one of the good things about being a Baptist church, I heard a Presbyterian preacher say, say, love preaching at Baptist churches because in the Baptist churches you hear this. <laughs> People are using the word. <laughs> that was R.C. Sproul that said that. He loved preaching for Baptist groups because you know, they're in the scripture. They're moving the word around. Matthew 22. Verse 15. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle him in his words. How many times have you been entangled in your words this past year? The Pharisees plotted how to entangle him in his words. How are you going to have wisdom not to be entangled in your words? They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully and you do not care about anyone's opinion for you are not swayed by appearances. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? And Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Therefore render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard it, they marveled, and they left him and went away. And we could look at other evidences of how Jesus walked wisely when dealing with people, and therefore wasn't trapped, and therefore wasn't crucified a day earlier than he was supposed to be crucified in the sovereignty of God. I mean, just thinking of that very humanly for a second. Everything happened according to the plan and the will of God. Jesus did not act or walk unwisely. Okay, so we need to have wisdom in dealing with those in authority, the wisdom of obedience, the wisdom of a cheerful mind, the wisdom of knowing when to die on a hill, and the wisdom to discern the times, the wisdom to be able to look at a situation and make careful and thoughtful analysis and act wisely. But the second thing I want us to note here is that human wisdom is limited and human power is limited. Look at verses 6 and 7 again of chapter 8 of Ecclesiastes. There's a time and a way for everything. That sounds like chapter 3, right? We've talked about knowing what time it is. It's a great wise man or woman who's able to know what time it is. And so he says it in essence again here. There's a time and a way for everything, although man's trouble lies heavy on him, for he does not know what it's to be. For who can tell him how it will be? No man has power to retain the spirit. That might mean the wind there. No man can control the wind or power over the day of death. There is no just discharge from war, nor will wickedness deliver those who are given to it. All this I observed while applying my heart to all that is done under the sun when man had power over man to his hurt. Now again, it is troublesome on one hand not to know the details of the future. God is merciful to us in not revealing to us the details of the future. Or we would go berserk right now instead of tomorrow. <laughs> right? He's merciful, but it is troublesome because we would like to know, well, this is all going to work out okay, and, and it's, it's not going to create too much disharmony and discomfort and trouble in my life. This is all going to pan out. Just, just be okay. We, we, we get troubled about the future. Maybe you go to the doctor, and the doctor looks you in the eye and says, I've got some bad news for you. you know, you've got cancer. I don't really know if we're going to be able to treat this or not. And you go home, and, you have to, and you're, all of a sudden... Your, your life passes before your eyes and you start thinking about all the things that are undone and all the things you'd like to do in the remaining years of your life and you just heard the word, the, the big C word. And sometimes that means a sentence of death a lot sooner than you expected. Not always, but you don't know, right? You may not know or maybe you do know. Maybe the doctor says, you know, I'm looking at this situation and it looks like you've got three weeks to live or three months to live. I mean, you still don't know for certain, but... We don't know. And not only do we not know, we, we can't control. We have no power over the wind. When a tornado is coming through town, or do you have the power to stand in front of that tornado and redirect it to somebody else's house? Not my house, Lord. Neighbor's not been too good. Let's send it over there. I mean, we can't direct the wind. We can pray, but we can't direct the wind. 
No power over the wind. No power over the day of death. We do all sorts of things to try to prolong life. And some of those things are good things. We should be healthy people. We should exercise. We should eat right. We should sleep right. We should drink 30 glasses of water or whatever the number is now a day. <laughs> you know, just take gallon, you know, strap gallon jugs of water to your bag. That's the remedy for everything. Drink water. But you can get water poisoning. Just be careful of that. But uh, <laughs> you, We can do all sorts of things. We have no power over the day of death. This came home to me. In a, in a powerful way just before I left to go to seminary. I went over to my barber here in town. This was a uh, Friday, I believe. I went over on Friday to the barber. And uh, my barber is 50 years old. So I go to the door there, and the owner of this shopping center is getting his hair cut. And he goes to the same barber that I go to. There's only one problem. The barber's not there. There's a lady cutting the guy's hair. And so I just walk in, kind of say, hey, what did you guys do? Run off? I won't name him, but run off the barber? He's kind of kidding around. And, and the lady said, well, uh, you're not going to believe this. He died this week. He died this week. It's like, I, I was stunned. I've been in there so many times, and you know, he's, he's younger than I am, and he said, yes, yeah, Sunday, uh, he, you know, he did all his normal things over the weekend, and Sunday he was fine, and Monday he woke up with a little fever. And so he went to the doctor. The doctor put him in the hospital, dead on Wednesday. Buried him, gone. Who, I, I had no idea. He had no idea. He didn't know. <laughs> he didn't know. He was doing his normal thing, planning to be at the barber shop. And so... Uh, so I'm getting my hair cut by a, a lady in the barber shop, sitting in a chair that I've sat in so many times before. But my barber's gone. Of course, I was overwhelmed with conviction about the many missed opportunities that I had in that barber chair. Missed opportunities, missed gospel opportunities in that barber chair, barber chair. But anyway, that's another story, another sermon. Died July the 9th, 50 years old. We do all sorts of things to ex try to extend life. We take medicines. You know, even when a person is in the last stage of their life, they can give them blood pressure thing. You know, do certain things with the blood pressure, try to keep it controlled, to keep a person lingering on. Fluids, we can feed people. In various ways, we can put, uh, put them on machines. We do things to look like we're going to live forever. We, we Botox, well, we don't, but you know, some people Botox and exercise and diet and some of those things, good things, things we should do, you know, not the Botox. But if you see my face all puffed up one morning because the bees have got me. You know? <laughs> Unless we're lost into a big television uh, enterprise here, and of course I'll have to do that. <laughs> I thought that was funny. We have no power over the day of death. It's coming, and you're not going to stop it. You're not going to stop your death. Are you prepared to die? It's not a question of if, it's a question of when. Are you prepared to die? And then he takes us to the battlefield in... Uh, Verse 8, the latter part, he says, there is no discharge from war. So in the midst of war, you got a soldier in the, in the heat of battle and says, you know what, uh, commanding officer, I think I'll go home. Not going to happen. He's not going home. Not in the heat of battle, not in the midst of war. He is under authority, and he is not going to leave. And then he says, and not only that, wickedness is not going to save you. Wickedness is not going to save you, nor will wickedness deliver those who are given to it. And so one might imagine he's going to save his life through wickedness, save himself from whatever the problem, I'm going to save myself through poverty by inventing some scheme, by robbing churches all over the county. Nope, that's not going to work. Wickedness will not deliver the person given to it. In fact, it will lead to your utter and total destruction. 
And Solomon says, All this I observe while applying my heart to all that is done under the sun when man had power over man to his hurt. So Solomon is looking over things in this life. People are in authority over us. They can do us harm. They can do us good. And Solomon has said, look, in essence, we need wisdom. We need a godly demeanor. We need to be obedient. We need to have the wisdom of the times. We need to do it wisely in this world. But we need to know the insufficiency of our wisdom and the insufficiency of our power because ultimately we don't know everything. And he's going to dig into that a little bit more. We don't know everything, and we can't control many things. Now, that could be liberating to a godly person. I mean, I don't have to know everything. When I'm standing before a loved one who's faced with some great horrific tragedy, I don't have to know all the specifics and give him all the specific answers to the details to why that has happened. That's liberating, by the way. And I don't have to control everything? You mean I'm really not God? I mean, that's why this is here, right? God is reminding us in so many ways. We need to walk humbly before our God. We don't know everything. And we can't control everything. So what do we do? We need to walk wisely through obedience, through honoring those in authority, by having a right demeanor, knowing the time of appeal, the time to not appeal, knowing when to take our stand, knowing when to back down. We need to have the wisdom and power. Uh, we need to have wisdom, but we need to know it's limited. We need to know our power is limited. We don't need to wring our hands. Look at verse 10 through 13. I saw the wicked buried. They used to go in and out of the holy place and were praised in the city where they had done such things. This also is vanity. So here you've got the problem of, of wicked people. You know, they go to the holy place. You know, maybe they're going into the, the, the center of worship, the holy city. They go in and out. They seem to have so much freedom and they're honored. Maybe they're honored in life and maybe they have an honorable burial. Their burial procession is proceeded with people praising their name, honoring them at their death. They've been honored. They've won all the awards. They've been recognized by religious society, civil society, by everyone for their accomplishments, for their honor. And they go to the grave and people in their grave uh, burial processional are singing their praises. Mind-boggling for the godly person. He sees that. I saw the wicked buried. By the way, the wicked are buried. They do die. They, uh, this is vanity because the sentence against an evil dude is, deed is not executed speedily the heart of the children of man is fully set to evil and so sometimes wicked people even when they are found guilty may not be uh, face the punishment for their crime immediately though a sinner does evil a hundred times and prolongs his life you know, through his through his evil and yet he lives a long life i mean he's just a a bad guy a bad girl and he lives a long, long life and seems to have lots of freedom. He's honored by everybody. And you're like, the godly person like David in the psalm says, what in the world is going, what's wrong with this picture? Because what happens often to the godly person? He says here in verse 12, Though a sinner does evil a hundred times and prolongs his life, yet I know it will be well with those who fear God because they fear before him. But it will not be well with the wicked, neither will he prolong his days like a shadow, because he does not fear before God. He's not going to prolong his days indefinitely. And it's not going to be well for him when he dies. So in other words, listen, as you look over this crazy, chaotic world where everything is upside down, justice is upside down, the wicked prosper, godly often suffer, you could pull your hair out, you could wring your hands, don't do that. God doesn't settle all accounts today there's coming another day there's coming a day of judgment there's coming a day of death and for the wicked the person who's committed his life to wickedness to rejecting Christ turning away from Christ he is going to stand before God and it's not going to go well for him he's been honored in the temple he's been honored in the community he's been he's honored at his death as a great wonderful outstanding man it's not well for him when he dies he is facing trouble that he can never recover from but for the godly man the man who knows now we know the whole with the whole of scripture the man who knows christ he will be raised to life it will be well for the godly man who may have suffered greatly in this life who didn't experience justice in this life who was treated in an ungodly way who was pressed down who had to to work for an, an unrighteous boss live in a 
in a country with an unrighteous leader to deal with unrighteous people all the time. It was often pressed down because of that. Things he couldn't control. But when he dies, it will be well with him. It will be well. This see, in other words, don't wring your hands, but know this, this life isn't all there is. There's coming a future life. Sixthly, rejoice. This is how we live wisely in a crazy world. He says in verse 14, There's vanity that takes place on earth. There are righteous people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the wicked. And there are wicked people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the righteous. You know, the, the righteous are sometimes negatively impacted by the wicked, and the wicked are often positively impacted by the righteous. They get more benefits from the righteous, and the wicked and the righteous may get more suffering because of the wicked in the world. He says, this is a van, this is a, a vain, empty puff of smoke, groundless thing, it seems, that takes place on the earth. The righteous people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the wicked, the wicked to whom it happens according to the deeds of the righteous. I said, this is vanity, but listen to this. This is what I commend. This is how you live right now. When governments are at war, when planes are being shot down, when justice is not served in the community, when you're facing the uncertainty of the future, this is what Solomon says, I commend joy. This is how you're to live under the sun and bring honor and glory to God. Not by wringing your hands in despair, not by being a fighter, rebel rouser, always ready to go to war, stand on every hill, die on every hill, turn the world upside down through rebellion, not through wringing your hands in despair, not by trying to control everything or trying to know everything. This is how you live. Psalm says, I commend joy. For man has nothing better under the sun but to eat and drink and be joyful, for this will go with him in his toil through the days of his life that God has given him under the sun. Now what does this kind of life say? When a person, as he lives his life in this crazy, chaotic world that we've described a little bit this morning that you know about a lot more, when he embraces this life with a sense of joy, he eats and he drinks and he receives the good gifts that God gives him as a blessing and he does so joyfully, what does that say? It says, this is not my home. Christ is my Lord. He is a good and gracious master. And he is ultimately trustworthy. Whatever may happen under the sun, God can be trusted. God can be trusted. And so, I commend joy. Eat, drink, be joyful. This is one way that God is going to help you to navigate through craziness and through sadness. He's not talking about a flippant, just sort of ha, 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 ha kind of life, but deep-seated contentment and joy, knowing that all is well because God is in control. God is running this show. And, and just when it seems like that he's not, when it seems like everything's unraveling and falling apart and there's no hope, and we're fearful and we're wringing our hands and we're cursing our leaders, God is in control. We have a sovereign God in control. In other words, live like that. Live like you believe that God is sovereign. Live like you believe that there is a king who doesn't oppress. There is a king who is good. There is a king who gave his life to die for sinners like us. Live like that. Rejoice. And you see, that's honoring to Christ. Do so with a sense of humility. Solomon says in verse 16, When I apply my heart to know wisdom and to see the business that is done on earth, how neither day nor night do one's eyes sleep. I mean, just think about it. Solomon saw that in his life. You see it in our life, right? Busyness. He's, I'm looking. I'm trying to know wisdom. I'm trying to figure out this stuff. Life under the sun. I see the business that's done on the earth. You know, folks don't sleep anymore. Day or night, they're on the run. They're busy, 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 busy. Then I saw what God has done. All the work of God. Six days created the heavens and the earth rested on the seventh day. We never rest. We just try to continue to control things and run things and know things. But anyway, verse 17. Then I saw all the work of God that man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun. However much man may toil in seeking, he will not find it out. Even though a wise man claims to know, he cannot figure it out. So on the one hand, we opened up, wisdom's good. Wisdom brings a shine to the face. It, it, it brings uh, an ability to deal with those in authority over you who may be oppressive, who may be unrighteous in many ways. 
Wisdom is a good thing. We should get wisdom. We should sell everything and get wisdom. We should seek after wisdom, Proverbs says, with all of our heart. But understand this, you're not going to know everything. You're not going to know everything. Be humble and be confident. Be confident. Justice is going to come. Now let me just wrap it up with a few thoughts here. We can't figure thing out, figure everything out, nor control things. There's some things God has revealed. God's revealed his word to us, right? And we spend all of our life trying to get to know God through his word, and we're never going to unravel all the scripture. The scripture is essentially clear. It's an excuse that people often make. Well, you know, I don't read the Bible because I can't understand the Bible. No, you read the Bible. The more you read the Bible, you pray, you read it prayerfully, humbly, thoughtfully, God will help you. You will learn the scripture. It's essentially clear, the scripture. I mean, there's difficult parts in the scripture, no doubt about that. It's essentially clear, and God has revealed his scripture. Know everything you can know about what God has revealed in his written word and in his creation. I mean, it's not, it's not a bad thing to know. It's not a bad thing to have knowledge. The wrong kind of knowledge, the wrong kind of approach to it can puff up, can bring pride. But the Bible doesn't condemn knowledge. It doesn't condemn wisdom. No, know what God has revealed. But there's some things God has concealed. And let me show you just a couple of examples. Let's turn to Isaiah 55. And then Romans 11. Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9. The Lord says, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, nor neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts so God's ways are high and then we go to Romans chapter 11 and we read the you know Paul is just caught up in a spirit of great worship and he says in verse uh, 33 oh the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God how unsearchable are his judgment and inscrutable his ways for who has known the mind of the Lord who has been his counselor or who has given a gift to him that it might be repaid. For from him and through him and to him are all things to him be glory forever and ever. There's some things God has revealed. There's some things God has concealed. The secret things of the Lord calls us to praise God in humility for his great omniscience and knowledge. Often heresies come to the church because people claim to know that which they cannot know. And so they write books like The Christian's Secret of a Happy Life, for example. And so they're going to take you into some secret knowledge. Some, some knowledge that's reserved for, for a few elite people. They're going to take you up into the clouds and they're going, to, they're going to communicate back to you secret knowledge. No. Be careful with that. When people are going to tell you something that no one's ever heard before. I heard a teacher say that one time. He says, come next week, I'm going to tell you things you've never heard before. They didn't teach you this in seminary. You haven't heard it in church. You haven't read it in theology books. And he went on and on down the line. No one's ever told you this before. Come next week, I'm going to tell you the secret things of God. Really? <laughs> really? We need to be content with that tension. We need to know everything we can know about God and His Word. Everything is revealed in Scripture. But at the end of the day, we need to also know and be humble before God. He's not revealed everything. He's concealed some things. There are great mysteries in God's universe that we bow down in humility before Him and we bless His name. We bless His name. So with our godly demeanor and regarding authority and understanding the times and, and our preparation to die, knowing the wicked die, the righteous die, all are going to die. For the righteous it's good, for the wicked it's bad. We need to accept our limitations. And that's what the wise man does. This is how to live wisely in a world out of control. We need to regard authority with a cheerful heart. We need to seek wisdom, but know the limitations of wisdom. We, know, we need to know the realities of the life and, and, of, and death of Christ. We need to know the justice of God. We need to fear God, embrace joy, live humbly, live confidently. We need to know the gospel, and that's where I close. Life beyond this life, that's what we need to know. How to have life beyond this life. How not to make this world your home and your heart and your life. I mean, just a couple of passages and I'm, I'm, I'm going to wrap it up here. John chapter 5. Let's go back to John 5. Verse 
There is a life beyond this life. He says in verse 28, Do not marvel at this. For an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear His voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. There is a life beyond this life. The new birth is a mysterious work of God. Turn back a page or two to John chapter 3. Jesus is teaching the religious leader Nicodemus that he needs to be born again. He says in verse 7, Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. You can't see the wind, you can't capture the wind, you can't control the wind, but when the wind of God's Spirit comes and opens a man's heart, you see the results of that wind. And that's the way it is with everyone born of the Spirit. When a person is saved by Christ, this mysterious work that we can't fully explain, we cannot understand it from what Scripture teaches us, we cannot fully grasp it and, and, and understand it, we see the impact of it. When God's Spirit changes a person's heart and life through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we see the evidence, the wind has come, the wind has changed things. I'm not the man I used to be. If you're a Christian, you're not the person you used to be. God's Spirit lives within us. God saves us not by the wisdom of the world. The world is churning out endless philosophies. Maybe you can glean some superficial things from some of that. But God saves us not by the wisdom of the world, but via faith. Matthew 11. Matthew 11. There's God's wisdom and there's man's wisdom. Matthew 11, verse 25. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you've hidden these things, the things related to the kingdom, entrance into the kingdom, life in the kingdom. You've hidden these things from the wise and, and understanding and revealed them to little children. Little children there is sucklings, babies nursing at their mother's breast. So God has revealed these wise things to sucklings, dependent ones. That's what he's saying. Yes, Father, for so it was your gracious will. All things have been handed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father. No one knows the Father except the Son. And anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him, come to me, all you labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. God saves not by the wisdom of the world and the knowledge of man, the person who thinks he's so smart, knows everything, got it all figured out, makes wild and crazy claims, that person can't come to the kingdom. It's the person who's like a little baby suckling, nursing at his mother's breast, recognizes his utter dependence on God. He can know nothing unless God had revealed it. And there are many things that God hasn't revealed. He humbly rests in the sovereignty of God when dealing with bad kings, bad bosses, bad husbands, you know, whatever it may be. Bad authorities, upside down world, injustices and all of that. He humbly trusts in a sovereign Christ who makes his way known to his children. William Cooper wrote a great hymn. God moves in a mysterious way. His wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. Deep and unfathomable minds of never-failing skill. He treasures up his bright designs and works his sovereign will. Blind unbelief is sure to err and scan his work in vain. God is his own interpreter and he will make it plain. Is it going to be good for you when you die? Or is it going to be bad? It will be good for you if you'll just turn your back on all the things that you're pursuing and putting your hope in and repent of your sins and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I receive your son. I trust Christ. Save me. Do for me what I cannot do for myself. Lord, thank you for the wisdom of your word. It's infallible and perfect. And yet, Lord, in our present state, we are fallen and we are fallible and we can't control things. We can't figure everything out. But we, this we can know. 
that you are a sovereign God, that your hands are not off the will, that you're ruling and reigning and leading and controlling and accomplishing your purposes. Lord, we're often bewildered. We look around us and say, how could this be happening? How could that be happening? Why is this wicked person prospering? Why is this godly person suffering? We can't figure all of that out. It makes it's craziness to us. We get orders from on high in various places that we don't understand. Why would they do that? And Lord, we can easily be tempted to wring our hands and be gripped by fear and lose hope or try to take over things control things forgive us Lord for our anxiety about the future for wringing hands and in, in troubled hearts that are we allow to become captured by fear forgive us when we are bombastic and unthoughtful and show no regard for those authorities that you have placed in the various jurisdictions of our lives. When we think we know better always and we disrespect and disregard and dismiss and talk and speak evil of. And when we sin against you by failing to pray for those authorities. Lord, we have no king but Christ, and yet you've placed many kings, leaders, authorities over us under the sun. Help us to be good citizens, to be good workers, to be good servants wherever you've placed us. And Lord, help us to leave this place knowing this morning that when we die, it will be well. It will be good for us, ultimately. That though we may have suffered many wrongs in this life and faced many challenges and disappointments, that there is something beyond life under the sun. And help us to cling to Christ this morning. And Lord, every day that we have left, help us to hear Solomon's commendation of joy and to honor God by enjoying the life that you've given us in our eating, in our drinking, in our relationships, in all that we do. So Lord, do your work that only you can do in the hearts of men. I pray in Jesus' name.